All right, so I don't know if you guys saw on the message board or email, um, I had a student who took CS201 with me last, yeah, in the fall, and she developed this site that's derived off of the uh, your homework site, that MetaCTF site. She developed this to help people study. <laughs> so these are a lot of the practice problems I have for the midterm for you guys to practice. Because that's basically these style of problems are what you're going to find on the midterm. So your username and your password for this site are the same as the other site. Uh, it's just OregonCTF.org colon 8000. Right now they're two separate sites because she's got her fork of my stuff and I've got my own. So uh, right now they're not integrated at all. Uh, so if you want to practice for the midterm, uh, I would suggest going here. And then uh, chapter two has got all of these uh, problems for you to solve. And so like, for example, hexadecimal to binary, one zero 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 one, And then you can get uh, instant feedback. That's a good job. So highly recommend that. Uh, it's optional. But uh, what I'm going to do is going to correlate uh, the performance of people who actually do it. I'll anon on anonymize everything. But that's my goal, is to see if this actually helps. And then see what, what kind of bump you get for, for doing this practice. So just throw that out there. It would be more effective if you assign randomly people to use the site and not to use That's the true, site. too, because then I get the motivated so I, people. I, mean, I was just trying to figure it's like, oh, sorry, that's right. You're right. You're totally right. Because what's going to happen is the good <laughs> students are going to use the site, and that's going to skew the results. Yeah. So it's going to prove that All right. students study. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's start off with floating point representation and operations. Uh, up until this point, uh, we looked at integer data types for our number system. <laughs> and so, uh, for example, a 32-bit unsigned integer. Um, one of its limits is that it's, it's got a range of whole numbers from zero to just over four billion. And so there are a lot of things that are integers that uh, go over four billion. So the national debt, the bank bailout bill, did this slide when the bank bailout bill was the thing, uh, Avogadro's number, and Google the number. Uh, and so um, even if you do have something like a 64-bit unsigned integer, um, that gets you a pretty good range as well, but it, then you don't get to represent the small numbers. Uh, so fractions uh, and these sorts of things. Uh, so this requires computers to develop a different interpretation of the bits. Now you remember, everything on, on the bottom is bits, and then we have to project semantics on top of it, whether it's ASCII, whether it's an integer representation. So the floating point representation is just one of those. It's a semantic that we project onto these bits. And there's two, two ways of doing this. There's the 32-bit way, which is in your C data type, it's called a float. And there's the 64-bit way, which is called the double. And both of these follow a standard format defined by the IEEE, which is a standards organization, it's a professional organization. Um, and they say exactly how these things are formatted. And then across all these different CPUs, you will typically have support for the IEEE floating point format. All right, so it's important to note that you have a 32-bit int and you have a 32-bit float. They both can only represent two to the 32 distinct values. So if you think about it, the, there is a trade-off. Because the float is trying to get you really large numbers and really small numbers, it is impossible for the float to represent every single integer from zero to four billion, right? So it's got to stop representing these whole numbers eventually. And there's a well-defined point where it stops, uh, which we'll uh, uh, get to later. Okay. So before I can teach you about the IEEE floating point format, I have to take you back to your number systems. Uh, and you recall the binary number system for each place, like uh, 125 in base 10, you have 1 times 10 squared, 2 times 10 to the first power, 5 times 10 to the zero. Uh, for fractional decimal numbers, you have the decimal point followed by the tenths and the hundredths place. And this is basically 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 3, etc. So 1 tenth, 1 one hundredth, 1 one thousandth to the other side. 
In base 2, you have a binary point, does the same thing. Uh, going off to the right, instead of 1 tenth, 1 one hundredth, 1 1 one thousandth, you have 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, etc. Right? So in this example, 101.11 1, 1 is 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the negative 1 plus 1 times 2 to the negative 2, which is a half and a quarter, these two parts. So this is 4 plus 1 plus a half plus a quarter, 5 and 3 quarters. All right. Uh, so let's get some practice. Uh, fractional binary number examples convert the following binary, binary number, numbers to decimal mixed numbers. Uh, yeah, and I have some extra, extra paper here for people who need it. Showing you is one half plus one quarter plus one eighth. And this would be so the one half is a, the zero spot, so this would be one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. Yeah, I have one more question uh, about this complement. Mm -hmm. So besides the formula in the book, there is another way in which I learned 171 where you just flip the numbers. Flip the bits and add one. Yeah. Yes. We, we, we briefly touched upon it, but yeah. So if it's a good way for an example, let's say. Yes. So, if you want yeah. the negative, you flip the bits and add one. Okay, so I hope we at least gotten one of these uh, done. Um, so for the first one, uh, you have the 2 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. So this is 2 and 7 eighths. <laughs> This is 1 plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth. This is 8 plus 2 plus 1 plus a half plus an eighth. And a key shortcut here, which I have overheard someone mention, is just like in regular decimal, the decimal uh, numbering system, if you see a number after the decimal point, you can just take that number divided by 2 to the power of however long your string is. So in this case, the shortcut here is this is 7 in binary, and then you go out three positions, so it's 2 cubed is in the denominator, so that's 7 eighths. This is a 7 as well, but it goes out four places, so it's 7 <coughs> sixteenths. This is a 5, and it goes out to the three places, so this is 5 eighths. Questions? <laughs> so that's the that's the little the little trick. All right. Okay. So uh, let's get back to our original problem. Uh, how can we represent very large or very small numbers in a compact representation? Uh, so the current way to represent a really large number in the integer numbering system that we saw is if you had something like this: five hundred times. 2 to the 100th, then what you would do is you would take your 101 and you would put 100 zeros after it, right? And that's basically this number. So this is not very compact at all. It's very accurate. You get every single whole number from 0 to 5 times 2 to the 100th, but obviously it's, it's impractical. Um, but another way to represent this is to say, you know what, I'm going to encode the 5 as 101, and then I'm going to encode the 100 as this binary string, which is, this is binary 100, trust me. Uh, so this is 11 bits. This is the heart of the IEEE floating point format. You take a fraction or a, you know, something normalized, we'll, we'll, say, we'll, we'll see later it's, it's going to be fractional, and then you multiply it by 2 to some exponent. And then your exponent can be either positive or negative, and that will give you the very large numbers and the very small numbers in a very compact representation. Okay, So that's what the IEEE standard 754 uh, is all about, and this is supported on most modern CPUs via the floating point unit. Um, so every, every processor has this floating point subsystem that implements IEEE floating point numbers. Okay, So large numbers will have a positive exponent e, like this one does, 
And then small numbers will have a negative exponent e, so negative 100 is what, what it is. Uh, it's important to note that you're going to have to do some rounding, right? And uh, when you're using floating point numbers, you have to take rounding into account. Otherwise, bad things happen. OK, so this is the specific format. Uh, there are three parts. There is the sign of the number that you're representing. And this is what negative 1 to the sign power is. So if the, the, if this is, uh, if the sign bit is 1, then it's a negative number. If the sign bit is 0, it's positive, as you would expect. Uh, and then you have the two parts. You have m, which is called the significant, or a, uh, your fractional number. And this is also, um, have you guys come across the mantissa notation? Mm -hmm. So it's your mantissa uh, for normal, like scientific uh, uh, rep numeric representation uses this, this format. Uh, and then the e is your possibly negative exponent. And then the value of any floating point number is negative 1 to the sine times the mantissa times 2 to the exponent. And then it just becomes a matter of how do I take the bits in my bit field and figure out what s, m, and e are. And that's the name of the game for floating point. Okay, so the sign, the, uh, the exponent, and the mantissa are encoded in these three fields, a sign field, an exponent field, and a fraction field. Um, but here's the thing, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. EXP doesn't equal E, fraction doesn't equal M. Uh, there are different interpretations of these fields based on where you are in the number system. So this is where the really confusing part of the floating point format comes in. Uh, but there's a really good reason why this has to happen. Uh, okay. So these are the three fields we'll be looking at, the sign, the exponent, and the fraction. Um, in terms of sizes, when you have a 32-bit float, the size of these fields, so the sign bit is always one bit. Uh, for a 32-bit float, you have eight exponent bits and 23 fraction bits. For a double precision, you have 11 exponent bits and 52 fraction bits. And then there's this extended precision uh, that Intel uh, supports within their FPU, which does an 80-bit uh, floating point number, which has 15 exponent bits and 63 fraction bits. OK. So this slide is going to be the heart of the IEEE floating point format. So knowing everything on this slide is what I would ask you to do uh, for any sort of floating point question. This has typically been the hardest thing for people to learn in this class. Yeah. What slide number is this? Uh, nine. Number nine for you watching at home. Uh, number nine is what you want. Uh, this, in a nutshell, explains how you parse a floating point number. All right. So depending on the exponent value, uh, the bits of a floating point number are interpreted differently. Almost all of the numbers in the floating point format are normalized. And so uh, this is defined as that exponent field be, being neither all zeros nor all ones. So anything non-zero or not all ones is normalized numbers. Uh, when this is the case, then this uh, the exponent uh, for the number is basically the exponent field minus some bias. And this is just a constant based on the size of your floating point number. And the constant is 127 for a single precision float. And a, it's 1, uh, 1,023 for a double precision float. And it's basically what it's doing is it's taking the range of exponents from 0 to the maximum number, and it's shifting it to straddle zero. It's just like in two's complement. You want to take that positive range, and if you want to do a negative thing, you have to shift it. Now, the way it shifts it is to just subtract a constant value from the number to get your negative, your negative exponent. So that's all it's doing. Uh, in a normalized format, the fraction field, uh, it, one is added to the fraction field to get your mantissa. If the exponent field is all zeros, then you have what's known as a denormalized number. And the denormalized range is for really small numbers. And the reason why there's a separate range for the denormalized numbers is because of this. Because if you're always adding 1 to the fraction and representing the number like that, you can't get to 0. 
And by golly, we need zero. Zero is very important. So that is why in the denormalized format, m is exactly the fraction. You don't add one to it. So it's, it's completely, you take that field and uh, the beginning of the fraction is where your dot is, your binary point. And then you, you, go, you go beyond that for, your, for the rest of the fraction. And then the exponent is uh, 1 minus the bias. So it's not. So the exponent field here is 0. Rather than being ne negative the, the bias, it's 1 minus the bias. And the reason why this is 1 minus the bias is because you got rid of this 1 in the fraction, and you want to smoothly transition from the normalized to the denormalized range. And we'll see this in a number line uh, in a couple of slides. But that's the, that's the main motivation. So it's basically the reason why there are these two different kinds of floating point numbers is to transition you away from the larger numbers smoothly into the small, smaller range. OK, there are some special values. And these special values uh, in your program, we want you to take care of as well. If you get a fraction field of 0, then this is how we encode uh, positive and negative infinity. We look at the sign, and the sign is either you know, negative or positive. So all 0 of the fraction, positive or negative infinity. Um, uh, if the fraction is not equal to 0, so this is if the exponent field is all 1. I'm sorry. So if the exponent field is all 1, this is your special case. Uh, your special case numbers. Uh, so the exponent field being all ones, and then the fraction field being zero. These two together mean that you have positive or negative infinity. Uh, so basically, that's what happens when you try to divide by zero. It breaks into the that, right? Yeah, it'll saturate to to to, to this number. Yes. And then if you have not a number, so for example, square root of negative one, uh, then th this is encoded as the exponent field being all ones and the fraction field being something non-zero. So these are special code points for those kinds of numbers. All right. Questions? This is the slide to digest. <laughs> it's just an algorithm. It's an algorithm for parsing the bits, basically. You guys haven't had a programming language class. It's just, yeah, parsing, <laughs> parsing the bits to be a certain thing. So we have a negative zero in this. Yeah, we do have a negative zero. Zero can be represented as, as both negative and positive. So let's, uh, so here's, here's what it looks like on a number line. Uh, you have negative infinity, negative normalized number, negative de denormalized numbers, zero, positive denormalized numbers, and normalized numbers, and then infinity. Okay. One of the nice things about this format is that your magnitude comparison can be done using the integer compare. It just so happens the way we organized the encoding, uh, integer representation, integer comparison works for the floating point compares. It's just magic that way. Consider it magic that way, but it's, it's very well designed. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. OK, so here's a normalized encoding example. You write this in your C program, 15,213. What does it show up as in your floating point format? If you go and you peek in memory, and I think I had this example earlier where I did the show bytes, and I had the 15,213, and it showed up as some 9B, 9F uh, sort of bytes. This is how you're going to be able to figure out how that representation gets generated. Um, so this is 15,213 as a binary number. We can normalize this. And the way you normalize this is to take that binary point and shift it all the way to the left until uh, the last one. Okay, So then this is 1.11011 1 uh, times 2 to the 13th because we took that binary point and we actually shifted it over 13 positions to get to the other side. So this is another way of writing 15,213 in normalized form. And then what we do, because it's uh, a normalized number. We take the fraction field of this. We get rid of this leading one. That's implicit. We don't need to encode that. Uh, uh, and then we make this the fraction field. So this is now the fraction field of the number. It's, it's basically this, and then you have a whole bunch of zeros uh, just because of the rest of the fraction is all zeros. Okay. So in red is our fraction field, and there should be 20 
uh, 23 bits here, a fraction. Uh, the exponent. Well, we just calculated the exponent as being 13. Uh, so the exponent itself is biased, right? When we store it into, into a representation, we have to add the bias to it. Because when we parse that number, we're going to be subtracting the bias from the exponent. So we take 13, and we add the bias. And we said earlier the bias is 127. And this makes the exponent field that we store 140. This is what we're storing as part of our representation. And this 140 is, is this bit string. 1000.1000.1100. This is your exponent field. So again, it's an 8-bit exponent field, 23-bit fraction field it's for a 32-bit float. OK. So those are the two parts of our of our uh, floating point number. Yep. I don't see a sign in there. So. Oh, yeah. The sign bit? Uh, the sign bit's here. But, like, uh, yeah, since it's, we know it's positive. So there's the sign bit. And then the, so you saw in the format sign bit, exponent field, fraction field. Sign bit is zero. The exponent bits are here in green. And then the, the fraction bits are here in red. That's the floating point format. So those field lengths are statically um, defined in the definition? Yeah. So as soon as you write float in C, it knows this format exactly. So, And then you can actually bring it up into the debugger and then see this bit field. In fact, that's what this is, normalized float.c. You define a, a, an, a number, and then it will spit out the underlying memory that's used to represent that number. But I, I won't go through this code uh, here. I'll go through the next one, the denormalized one. All right. Questions about this format? Quick question. On the bias, is it always 127 or uh, 1023? Yeah, for either a float or a double. Now, here's the thing with your assignment. You're going to calculate the bias. And the way you calculate the bias is that, hey, if my um, my Num if the number of exponent bits is 4, then I know the range of exponents can be zero, can have 16 values. The way you do the bias is to make sure that half of that range is in negative and half of it is in positive. So you take half, you say, basically you take the number of exponent bits, you go 2 to the number of exponent bits minus 1, that gives you half the range, and then minus 1 because we actually will put that below it. So programmatically, that's what we're going to ask you to do. When you get the number of bits in the fraction, number of bits in the exponent, and then the representation, you're going to programmatically take the number of bits in the exponent and calculate what the bias should be using that formula. OK, and then this is what it ends up being. So hex 4, hex 6 x 6 db 400 this is what you will see in memory. In fact, this is what this program should spit out when you run it as being the byte, rep the byte representation of this floating point number. So the bias is half the range minus 1. Yeah. OK, here's another example. You write this, and this is a really tiny number, and this is I'm going to show you the denormalized one, uh, 7.3. 4, 7 times 10 to the negative 39. And uh, this is a program that will uh, help you parse this. It'll dump out the, um, the, the encoding. So let me show you that. And this is code is all, is all there available for you to run yourself. Um, show bits is a function that allows me to go from left to right, showing you the bits of that uh, it's sort of like show bytes in the previous uh, class, only it's going bitwise instead of uh, bytewise. Um, so this is my uh, declaration, my floating point number here, and then this printf is just formatting to show you what's going on. And then I do a show float, uh, and then I show you exactly what these bits are. So this is 7.347. This is the number we want to convert. Uh, and as it turns out, 
when you declare that in your program, the floating point number system can't exactly represent these code points. And so when you uh, define that in your program and then you call printf on it, you'll see that printf is going to give you this, 7.346999 times 10 to the negative 39. So there's your error. Every time you write a floating point number, you can almost guarantee there's going to be an error associated with what the processor can represent. Um, this is the, uh, the IEEE representation of it is a zero. The exponent field is all zeros. So this indicates a denormalized number. And of course, all the really small numbers are denormalized. And then this is the fraction field. And the way you would parse this, the sine bit is zero. The exponent field E is one minus the bias. So this would be negative 126. Uh, the fraction field is one half plus one eighth, and then we can just assume that's all zero. It's close enough. <laughs> uh, so this is 0.625. And if I do this in a arbitrary precision calculator, which is what BC is, if I take uh, 0 0.6, well, I'll take two to the negative 126, and then I'll multiply that by 0.625, you will see all the way off to the right is your 734683 That's your that's your number that you represented. So this is your it's not even it's not even that. It's actually it's actually worse. <laughs> so that's the denormalized representation. So you can go look in the both the normalized uh, example and this denormalized example to, sh to to see the bits as they're being stored. Yeah. Um, is, is there any fraction to the normalizing numbers? Um, it's just to get you those code the the numbers very close to zero. Uh, it's a it's a mechanism to get you all the way close to zero. Okay. And the reason why this isn't this isn't what this says is because I got rid of those bits. <laughs> those bits actually matter. Um, which is why it didn't match up, I should say. All right. Okay, so what is the distribution of values in the floating point number format? It helps to visualize this. Um, so here is an example of a seven bit format, four exponent bits, three fraction bits. Now the bias is seven, so it's, it's, the bias is always set to half of the range of the exponent minus one. So the range of the exponent is uh, 16, because there's four exponent bits, so half of it is eight minus one, that makes the bias seven. So that's the formula you need to apply in your program to figure out the bias uh, for, for that number. Um, and so if you look at the code points, you'll see that as you get closer to zero, you get much more accurate, and then as you go further away from zero, the code points, the number points are, are more sparse. So this, like, uh, a lot of times when you're having to do really high precision and not want to, like, sacrifice too much, is there, it's pretty common to represent integer and regular integer and keep the, the fractions um, component in double? Or uh, not that I know of. Um, well, it's the like. Um, there, you would want to, uh, if you if you cannot handle the, the IEEE uh, precision that the hardware is giving you, you would have to emulate in software, and this is what these arbitrary uh, number sort of packages will do. But that's a cost, right? Because then you're doing in software what the hardware was meant to do. No, no most of yeah. I'm just saying. Like, yeah. If you happen to run into a weird thing where you happen to have really high precision numbers, but like you know, close to a couple billion or something like that, then you're going to want to, like, have a, you're going to want to have something else store, like, the, the fractional component. That we'll store. talk about this. If you have uh, a mixture of small numbers that require your, your, your precision and large numbers that you might be adding to it, you don't want to be combining them early. No. You want to do your large operations first, small operations second, and then combine them. And so we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> okay, so uh, using this formula, uh, so I've taken the 7-bit representation, and I've taken all of the code points from all zeros 
to almost all ones. You remember that when you have all ones in the exponent, that's where the normalized numbers stop. So the largest number that you'll get in, in a, a, a non-special number, the largest non-special number is a zero in the sign, because it's positive, uh, 1110 as the exponent, because that's the largest exponent where the bits aren't all one, and then all ones in the fraction. So if you look at this, uh, the denormalized range starts at the beginning because the exponents are all zero. Uh, and then here is the E field is one minus the bias. So when you're denormalized, then the uh, capital E is basically negative six. And then the fraction field is exactly what the fraction field has without adding one. So in this case, uh, let's take the first code point. Uh, the exponent, 1 minus the bias is negative 6. In fact, for all of these things, it's negative 6. The fraction field is 1 8. So this is uh, 2 to the negative 6, which is 164, times 1 8, which is the fraction field. And that gets you 1 5 twelfths. So that's the smallest non-zero number the 7-bit format can represent. Uh, as you increase the fraction field from 001 to 010, etc., you're just increasing this fractional part, m, from 1 8 to 2 8 to 3 8 all the way to 7 8 And this gets you equal increments all the way to 7 5 twelfths. As soon as you go to the next code point, your exponent field is no longer 0. And this is going to flip you over to the normalized numbers. And with the normalized numbers, the exponent, the exponent is the exponent field minus the bias. So the exponent, oh, exponent here is 1. 1 minus the bias is, again, negative 6. So this is the smooth transition that I'm talking about. So now the, this is still 164. But if you look at the fraction field, the fraction field is all zeros, but then I'm going to add 1 to it. So now this is basically 1 times 164, which is... Uh, Yeah, 1 times 164, which is the same as 8, 5, 12, same thing. <laughs> so this is where you transition exactly as you would uh, very smoothly into the normalized numbers. And then eventually this will diverge into larger and larger increments as your, your exponents uh, get higher. Okay, uh, at the very end, you have the exponent field is 1110. So this is 14. And so... Capital E is 14 minus 7, so this is, uh, uh, is 2 to the 7th. 2 to the 7th is 128. Uh, a fraction field of all 1s is basically uh, 1 and 7 eighths, which is also 15 eighths. So 15 eighths times 128, it's 240. That's the largest number in this format that you can represent. This might require some practice, which is why that practice site is there, because the practice site will help uh, will ask you some of those questions. And actually, implementing your program that'll help immensely, uh, which is actually why I have you do this as a program, because this never sinks in with with one one hour of lecture, it just never does. So, in fact, actually, right after this lecture, if you can go do the practice problems. There's two, uh, well, there, I think there's just one floating point one at the very end. That would be my recommendation. Okay, well, let's do practice problem 247. Consider a five-bit IEEE floating point representation. It's got a single sign bit, two exponent bits, two fraction bits. And so the range on the, uh, the exponents is four. So half of it is two minus one is one. So the bias is one. So this is a trivial floating point example. I want you to do row number two and row number four. Uh, figure out what the exponent field is, which is really an easy translation, but, but make it in decimal. And then figure out what capital E should be. So capital E is based on that formula, right? If it's denormalized, then it's one minus the bias. If it's normalized, then it's the exponent minus the bias. Uh, then I want you to calculate the fraction field, or and that's directly from the bits, followed by the m, the mantissa. 
And whether or not n adds 1 or not is based on whether it's normalized or denormalized. And then finally, use the formula of the m times 2 to the e to figure out the value of these two numbers uh, in that format. So I'll give you a couple minutes for that. Okay. So let's start with the first one. The exponent field is zero. So in the formula, capital E is one minus the bias. So one minus the bias is still zero. Uh, the fraction field is one, one. So because it's denormalized, it's directly what the fraction field is, which is one half plus one quarter, which is three quarters. Uh, capital M, because it's denormalized, is just the fraction field. So M is three quarters. And then the value is basically M times two to the E. So three quarters times two to the zeroth power is still three quarters. Two to the zeroth power is one. You still get three quarters. Okay, this one down here, exponent field is one. It's a normalized number. So the exponent e is the exponent field minus the bias. So it's still one minus one. Trivial example again. So this is zero. Capital E is zero. But it's, it's zero for a different reason. <laughs> yeah, it's still the exponent field minus the bias. Uh, the fraction field uh, is one half. So one zero is one half. Uh, because this is a normalized number, you add one to the fraction field to get m. So then capital M is one and a half. You take m times two to the e, which is zero again, and you get one and a half as your value. Can you go for the exponent field and the exponent field? Yes. So the exponent field is non-zero. So you know that this is a normalized number. The formula for calculating e on a normalized number is to take the exponent field and subtract the bias. So the exponent field is 1, and the bias is 1, so you get 0 again. Yes. So it's just because that this is a trivial example that it's basically the same, give you the same exponent. But there are better examples in the book and on the site that yeah, use like 5 bit or like 7 bit yeah, numbers yeah, or 6 bit numbers yeah, that have yeah, like 3 yeah. or 4 exponent bits so that you can, you can do better yeah, yeah, this is 3 quarters and this is 2 and then you one yeah you find that the same way to you know why it's zero one no no yeah you add one quarter yeah and that's where we got this one and a half uh in this in this yeah. episode. Okay, um, back to, to your point about precision. So it turns out floating point addition is commutative, but, not uh, but it's not associative, and it's exactly because of this precision uh, problem in associativity. So if you take 3.14 and you add 10 to the 10th to it, and then you subtract 10 to the 10th from it, uh, this is going to give you zero because when you add 10 to the 10th to 3.14, it's going to basically blow up the the number, and you're going to lose the fact that this is, has, has, has been added in there. But if you take the 10 to the 10th minus 10 to the 10th first, the result's going to be 3.14, because this is going to turn into 0, and then you have at this end of the range 3.14. And the idea is similar and when you're doing scientific computations and you have to like uh, remove the significant digits. You get that, that rounding problem. And these things, if you're not careful, if you're doing scientific computations and you're not careful about where the rounding happens and where the error happens and you don't take into account that those errors are happening, that's where the trouble is uh, in the program. Um, floating point multiplication, again, is not associative and it does not distribute over addition. And this is exactly the same issue because here you have uh, 10 to the 20th minus 10 to the 20th. And you, um, you do the parentheses first, and you get 0, uh, because this turns into 0. But if you just try to distribute, then this immediately turns into, actually, it's going to be, yeah. 
I think that's going to be not a number. I thought it was going to be infinity. No, but it won't know the sign. So this is this is going to turn into not a number because you've saturated the number system. It, it won't be able to represent any of that stuff. Okay. So here's where the rubber hits the road. Here are some very famous cases where uh, your lack of precision has led to disaster. So the Patriot missile, um, this was in the first Iraq war. Uh, we had these Patriot missile systems protecting uh, against Iraq uh, Scud missiles. I think this was in, was it in Lebanon? Probably. Yeah. Any of you remember? Uh, and the reason why was that uh, every couple of weeks you needed to reset the Patriot missile system because the way it calculated time had a rounding error in it. And then over time, its notion of time would start to get skewed. Uh, and so uh, because of that, uh, it failed to intercept uh, several Scud missiles and then and led to this. And so that was the post-mortem. And these were the errors that we spent enough resources to try and track down. Who knows what other errors there are that didn't have this kind of effect that have, that have gone on. Uh, the Ariane 5 is the most expensive uh, floating point error. Uh, well, one of the most, because this is like a $4 billion, this is the Ariane 5, a $4 billion rocket to, to dis deploy satellites. And this blew up after launch because of floating point error. And it was insidious because they actually casted the floating point number into an integer. And then as it went operational, the integer obviously overflowed. <laughs> and this was because, I believe this was the case where uh, they increased the, from an 8-bit to a 16-bit system. And then they they forgot that this 8-bit code was there, and then it blew up this, yeah, this, this satellite. Uh, my favorite, which which always gets a laugh, is the square root estimator uh, on Windows, which I think if, if you've seen it, is sort of sort of funny, and it it's never gets nice. fixed. So this one is the square root of 4 is 2. That's great. And then if you subtract 2 from it, you don't get zero. <laughs> so it's not actually two. So it's not actually two. Uh, so that that's there. So we're using a lie or something. Our life, we think it could like zero, but no. Yeah, and, and I bet you if you're in high school and you put this number down as your uh, answer, <laughs> you won't, wouldn't get it right. <laughs> in fact, you'd get reported for cheating maybe because uh, they're like, yeah, no calculators were allowed on this exam. Yeah, if I ask you this on the exam, because it's closed calculators, <laughs> then I'll know. <laughs> Something's up, yeah. I'm pretty sure that Microsoft has kept that one in there on purpose at this point, because it's just hilarious. I it's to raise awareness. of, of So it's no so that people like me can teach about rounding problems and, and errors in number systems, I think. <laughs> so like, uh, <laughs> the me-centric explanation, yeah. They didn't really care if they would do the alpha method, which is to create an entirely new exception so that when someone does that operation, they would manually return to the correct answer. Yeah, well, in fact, um, so the famous Intel, so Intel had a floating point error as well, and what they had to do was something similar. Uh, they had to patch up, because there, it was in silicon, that yeah. error, then people are relying on the floating point unit to give them floating point results that are correct. And so they had to actually patch it in, I think it's microcode or firmware, that, yeah. those particular ranges to patch that error. That actually is the most expensive floating point error. It's not, it's not really a calculation error, it's the implementation error. That cost Intel billions uh, about 20 years ago, that oh. floating point error. Yeah, and that was... Um, Nearly like killing them. Actually. That was not a happy time at Intel. Uh, so generally speaking, when we talk about computers, that's like a general question. All the results we get either from a calculator or from a computer, it's generally like a very, very close approximation of what it's supposed to be, but it's technically not exactly the, the thing. Like sometimes it's exact. Very large numbers, yeah, right? sometimes it's exact, and sometimes it's not. You, All of you in the room now can reason about that. I think the issue is is when people assume either exact or, or, or misestimate the non-exactness, that's where you get into, into trouble. And so that's why this is here. Because now all of you know, okay, integers, exact whole numbers, got that, but they can be overflowed. <laughs> uh, floating point numbers, I gotta be careful. Or I have to know where my errors are. So, all right. 
Okay, um, so in, in C, we talked about floats and doubles, single precision and double precision. Um, as it turns out, you can cast between number systems. Uh, you can cast between an int and a float and a double. And when you do your cast, it can result in sometimes inexact conversions, as we saw with the Arion satellite, where they were casting a float into an integer and causing the thing to... Uh, don't worry, C will never cell. warn you because it's allowed to do that implicitly. Yes, so C won't C won't tell you. <laughs> C's not going to tell you a lot of things, actually, uh, which is the issue. But it's really nice to program in C because so much stuff you just throw down and the compiler will generate code for you. So that's the issue. Um, okay, so... Yeah. My, my favorite part of C is that the entire C standard uh, slash C Bible comprises about 300 or so pages. But the entire C++ standard comprises about 1,400 pages. Right, so if you cast a float to an int, and your float is beyond, the number that you're trying to cast is beyond the, the integer range, uh, this is going to saturate to either the minimum int or the maximum int. So if you go you know, into the denormalized range and you try and cast, you'll get zero. Or if you go into the normalized range all at the top end, you'll get 4 billion. When you do the cast, uh, the double to an int is the same as the float. Uh, if you go from the int to a double, you can get an exact conversion. And the reason why is that that fraction field in a double is 52 bits, and your integer is, is 32. Like so you have all the precision you need in the fraction field to represent every single code point in the integer number space. Uh, the issue is when you take an int and you go to a float, you don't. You only have 23 bits of fraction. So if you have an integer that ha that needs more than 23 bits to be represented, it won't be represented accurately in a float. So it's just truncates the remaining. Yeah, it truncates that that part that it can't can't represent. So if you have a one followed by uh, 22 zeros followed by another one, then it well, how am I going to make that a fraction field that I can put in a 23-bit thing? I can't. I have to get rid of that, that one. That's where your precision is lost when you go from a float, uh, from an int to a float, basically. All right. So we'll do some floating point puzzles. Based on that information, uh, these are those, those tricks, you know, sort of the end of last class to, to, to give you some mental exercise. So I have an integer x, a float f, and a double d. Assume that the double or and the float is neither is not it, it's they're neither not a number, so they're just regular floats and floating point numbers. Uh, determine whether these these expressions are true or false. The first one is is x the same as x casted to a float then casted back to an integer? Maybe. Always, I should say. Is it always? Is uh, my statement. This is false uh, because you have that 23-bit fraction. Uh, the next one is yeah. true. true. Uh, the next one. Yeah. Uh, if it's double into a float, right? You take your float. This is starts out as a float. Oh, it starts it goes to a double and then back to a float. Oh, yeah. yeah it's going to. It's the same format. This is good. Yeah. Because double is uh, increasing your precision, and then you go back to a float, and you can you can get that back. Uh, take the double, cast it to a float, and see if it's equal to... No. Yeah, that would be easy. <laughs> uh, is the floating point number the same as negative, negative floating point number? No. Yeah, this is just twiddling the sign of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, so, so, here's something interesting. 2 divided by 3, is that equal to 2 divided by 3.0? No. No. No, why? Because three point zero makes an input to cast to floats. In the two divided by three point zero, it'll cast the integer to a float. I think. This side or that side? This. Well, on the left side, it'll just do integer do integer division and give you zero. And give you zero. On the right side, it'll so it cast the integer in, as a float and it, it'll give you one. You have a floating point number here, so this. Six, 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 yeah. Seven. So this division will give you a floating point number. Uh, so yeah. 2 divided by 3 will give you 0. This will give you that 
point six six in floating point, and that's a zero. Yeah, we surround the two divided by five point zero, and then you cast that to an int. It should equal out again. If yeah. You... If you cast, yeah. If you cast this as an int, yeah, that it will turn it to zero, and that'll be true. It always zero. Yeah, it'll truncate off that. All right, the next one. Your double is less than zero, and then is d times two also less than zero? Uh, yes, d is a negative. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is saying if d is a negative number and you multiply it by two, well, you still get a negative number. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, this this trick is uh, yeah, if you get negative infinity, if you're beyond that range. Okay, that one's good. That one is. Um, if d is greater than f, then is negative f greater than negative d? I'm guessing yes too. D times D, is that greater than or equal to zero? With the uh, assumption of positive infinity. Oh, yeah. Uh, D plus F minus D, is that the same as F? I have a question. Oh. Um, so are we saying um, instead of considering over plus case, we consider just the positive infinity? That's what we're saying? Yeah, so okay. there is no overflow okay, because we have the positive infinity. Right. Yeah. Which is different than the integer, obviously. Uh, you can get positive infinity, so yeah, so that's your over, that's your same thing. I mean, yeah, if you consider that an overflow, yeah. Uh, see, with, with two's complement or unsigned integers, your overflow is actually changing the value of the number significantly, so that makes it difficult. That That's more like an error condition, whereas here, you just said, oh, that's positive infinity. At least I know it's infinite. Uh, the other one is like, well, did that wrap around or not? Well, I have to check for that condition, like the, the different flags before. I have to check that number, yeah. the operation before yeah. I do it. All right, this one. True or false? Yes or no? Depends on the compiler. This is, uh, this is not associated for the exact reason that we talked about before, because you have these rounding issues. And so this does not associate. Uh, uh, this, you would expect d minus d to give you 0, but because of this, throws you into a different range. Then when you subtract d, you might get something different. That's the idea. So it's not not associative because you know you would uh, it's commutative but not associative, which means that I can't do the d minus d first plus f to to, to get you the f again. That's the issue. Can you do add a double and close? What does that is f? Uh, I believe this will go. Oh, that's a good question. Internal. Doesn't it, doesn't doesn't it cast that it's the largest? Yeah, that, I think it casts it to the double and then back to the float. That, so that's where that depends really? on the compiler part comes in. I actually don't know. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say one way or the other because it's on video. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's where that depends on the compiler part comes in because some compilers will go back down to float because it's faster. Some compilers will stay as double because it's more precise. Some compilers will stay as double until you pass 03, and then it'll go to a float because it's faster. So some compilers will be like, oh, yeah, I can um, symbolically know what you want here. Like, if I stay in the symbolic range, then I, I actually won't even do the addition or the subtraction uh, yeah. as well. So if you, if you actually compile this with optimizations turned on, you won't even do this addition and subtraction. You'll see that underneath, yeah. it's like, you know, this is true all the time. Yeah, while true is basically what this evaluates to for a good compiler, yeah. So when you go from a float to an int, or into a float, the bit level representation changes completely? Yes. Okay. So this is, com this is different than the integer, signed and unsigned integers, where the bit representation stays the same and you reinterpret the bits differently. Or even like a float to a double, it's just sliding stuff over and truncated stuff. It's sliding stuff over, but then the exponent really does have to be converted. Uh, so you'll see that, oh, okay. yeah, because the bias changed uh, between oh, okay, the two. Okay, so the bit level representation changes completely there. Completely there, too, yeah. Uh, and if you have a floating point number that repre represents a number larger than, like, 4 billion, and you go to an end, it'll just go to the bit level representation of 4, 4 billion. Okay. Yeah. Saturates to Tmax. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
Okay, so recall this was a no. Is x equal to the uh, x casted to a float back to the int? Um, we said no, but when you compile it with optimizations turned on, this is actually true. So what's going on here? Uh, and this is part of your, uh, this is in your textbook. But actually, what's in the textbook isn't necessarily true all the time. There are two explanations <laughs> for this. Uh, I believe the one in the textbook says um, in x86, uh, the Intel floating point unit has these 80-bit registers, and that's what it used uses to calculate all the floating point operations. And if it doesn't have to bring it back out of the floating point unit and store it, it will keep it in that, in a register in the floating point unit as is. So then when you do this, it's actually going to keep the result in that floating point unit at full precision in the 80-bit format, which is more than enough for every single integer. Um, so that when this happens, it's like, oh, I got the full precision. The other thing that happens is um, the compiler can easily figure out that this is a useless <laughs> cast, optimize it out. And so that's what uh, this program does. I have a make file that compiles this C program, and it basically is this cast two ways. And you, so the reason why uh, this is there is because uh, it used to be number one was the reason, but I just tried it uh, yesterday. <laughs> And it just completely skips it now. It just like bypasses the whole thing. So now it's number two also. Yeah. Is that one of the reasons why like GPUs are actually optimized for floating points? Is they just have larger registers and probably computation separate uh, computation circuits to deal with those sort of comparisons and interactions? Yeah, in a, yeah, that's one of the reasons. Uh, we'll talk about uh, vectored operations. That's basically what GPUs are are good for. Uh, and you have a lot of vectors when you're talking about graphics. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to be expecting to know compiler optimizations. Then. No, no. no. <laughs> this is just uh, this is just to give give you more well-rounded information. I would say uh, definitely uh, when you're preparing for that midterm, you just do the practice problems and you do that practice site. That's the kind of stuff that that yeah. Okay, so that's floating point. Uh, the next half of this class is operations in arithmetic, let's see. Uh, 